Okay, on the count of three, we're going to read together 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Lord God, we pray for this message to take hold of us, and we pray for focus and concentration. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to bring revelation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, dear. All right. Does anybody remember the, the Bible verse from last week? I meant to do that before I did it. Yes. Hebrews 12, 3. I, I want to do this every week to see if you remember. What did I talk about last week? Ben. Ben? ben? Any, any takers on that? What was the message last Sunday? Yes, sure, it's in there someplace. Peter, what was the message last Sunday? Um, life is not, it's a journey, a long journey, not a sprint. I knew you'd know that. <laughs> what was the Bible verse? Hebrews 12, 3. Uh, consider him who endured uh, such, uh, endure from evil men such well, sinners, sinners, such hostilities against itself, so that <coughs> Good job. So I didn't waste all Sunday last week. I got one one of you remember the most. Oh, and Jennifer. <laughs> um, well, this is the follow-on to that. So you're on a long journey. Don't give up. You, you've got an end destination that you're shooting for. And just because you might have a, a problem or issues in that journey, it doesn't mean it's not you can't make it right with God, that he won't heal that. Because he's looking for the end result, right? So don't get discouraged and stay faithful to him. He'll stay faithful to you. Well, at the other end of this, the end of the journey, what happens? We've talked about judgment day, but there's also a place that we're going. We have a final destination called heaven. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. It's the living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Jesus rose from the dead. A lot of people on the Catholic calendar are celebrating their Good Friday, and now they're celebrating what they call Easter today, uh, which, as we know, is, um, is uh, actually a pagan reference that should never have been in the King James Bible, but they continue to use it. Um, it should be Passover if you're talking about uh, what happened. We know that in... Um, Around April, um, we can kind of peg this as probably around April 3rd, if one of the dates of Christ's life is correct, uh, would have been um, Passover. But the problem is they were on a lunar calendar, not a solar calendar. So we really don't know the day. And um, all of this comes from Catholicism, the whole calendar. Whenever you hear Good Friday, Palm Sunday, blah, blah, that's all Catholic and it is not in your Bible. They represent events that did happen in the Bible, but we don't know the date. So, um, but it's always good to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. There's nothing wrong with that, of course. And uh, so this is what this is pointing to, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable. You're going to inherit something through your faith in Christ. And it is a place and a blessing and it is eternal life, imperishable, will not die, undefiled, can't be corrupted, unfading. It's just as strong a promise, and all of the good things are still there, just as Christ promised to us. Kept in heaven for you. So you don't see it right now. You see little glimpses of, of, of things that pertain to God in heaven, but you're not there now. And there's so much more for each one of us in heaven that we are not even aware of at this time. 
who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Your salvation has not yet been revealed to you. We've talked about it, that the Holy Spirit has been given to you, indicating that this is true, that you have this, that these promises of the inheritance in heaven are real for you. But we, we can't draw, we can't paint a picture of heaven because none of us have seen it. Well, one man saw it that we know of, and his name is Paul. And he said um, in 2 Corinthians 12, 2, 5, 2 Corinthians 12, 2 to 5, He's speaking in the third person. So he's actually talking about himself, but God has given him humility through suffering, a thorn in the flesh. Anyway, he doesn't want to draw too much attention to himself, so he talks as if he's talking about someone else. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast except for my weakness. So he's saying that he was called up in the spirit. Somehow he, was, he might have been in his actual body, or it could have been some spiritual form of that. But he was in he the third heaven. So he's, there's a first heaven, which is what you see out here. It's the sky and, and the things that we see there. And then there's a second heaven that is not fully described in Scripture, but that many times there are references to the heavenly realm, and that can include uh, satanic activity. There's, a, there's another part of that in between this sky heaven and then God's third heaven. And the Bible also says that the, God is enthro enthroned in the highest heaven. So that would be the third heaven. And um, that's the heaven where Paul was caught up into. That's where God is. That's where the heavenly angels are. Except, I guess, when they're doing battle in the second heaven against the demonic realm, Satan's realm. So he saw that. And because he saw it, he can speak about heaven as it's real. He says in Philippians 1, 22 to 24, Philippians 1, 22 to 24, if I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. He's saying he's at, he's, he's at the point where he may be killed for his faith. And he's saying, I would rather die for Jesus, but I'm not going to. He's not going to commit suicide. He's not going to precipitate his own death. He's going to let God call him out when the time is right. And that's what he's looking forward to because he knows what it is. He knows what heaven is. It's more real to him. And then he says, but, I'll, but to remain in the flesh here on earth is more necessary on your account. Why are we here? It's to serve one another. It's to serve God. It's to do good deeds for one another. And we think about heaven as the final reward that is based on how we live now, what we do in the flesh. And Paul's not thinking about himself in this regard. If he's thinking about himself, he's going to say, God, take me home. I'm, I'm out of here. I'm tired of the rebellious churches. I'm tired of the demonic attacks. I'm tired of, of everybody questioning my faith and, and people turning on me and all of the disappointments and the physical struggles. He was beaten and whipped and shipwrecked and everything else. And he's saying, I want to go home. That's where he wants to be. My desire is to depart to be with Christ, That is, for it is far better. But while I'm here, I'm serving. While I'm here, I'm thinking about other people. And when I think about other people, my reward in heaven is actually greater. Instead of thinking about myself and doing what I want to do, when I think about Jesus, when I serve him because I, I love him, and I am showing gratitude to him and loving my brothers and sisters in Christ. My reward is greater in heaven. Well, he mentions paradise, the word paradise in, in, in that 2 Corinthians 12. This man was caught up into paradise. What does paradise mean? 
It's a Persian word that referred to an enclosed hunting park. So the king would go out and hunt for animals. He'd have a large area, but it was walled in, so the animals couldn't get out, and it was beautiful. It would have been arranged perhaps like a garden and with forests and, and a lovely place. It's a pleasure ground, Grove Park. The Jews uh, used to refer to this area or use this word when they talked about the abode of the souls of the pious, the, the holy ones, until resurrection. So like a holding place until they are actually redeemed. Um, and the early church fathers, so you're talking about the, the first leaders of the church, um, would have been the apostles, and then the next generation after that, and I don't know how far into that, but they referred to paradise um, as if it were Eden, where Adam and Eve were. So that kind of a garden type of place where God is accessible, where he's walking freely with us. And it, they, they believed it wasn't on heaven or earth, it was some other place. And also, paradise can be used for the word heaven. You remember the thief on the cross, and he said he believed in Jesus, and Jesus said, you know, he said, remember me when you enter your kingdom, and he said, today you will be with me in paradise. So it may be that holding place. It's wherever God is, but it's a pleasurable place. It's a, a beautiful place. Um, and I mentioned that, um, you know, Paul goes on in 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 1 to 10, he talks about a tent. He says, for we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, that's our body, we have a building from God. So you're in a tent. This is temporary. Our bodies are dying and getting older and wearing out. Uh, but we have a building from God, something that's structurally sound that won't disappear. A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. It'll never end. When you're in the, your father's house in heaven, you'll be there forever. No more dying. For in this tent we groan. It's difficult being alive. And we should never look at our lives as something permanent. And that whatever we're experiencing now, whether it's suffering or whether it's pleasure or blessing, it's not going to last. Did you know that? I know that. It's, I'll be 61 this month. I know that. <laughs> Whenever I've got things going on really well, I don't get too excited. And whenever things are really bad, I always say, well, there's always tomorrow. It can get better, as, as we just talked about that testimony from Jennifer. It's never that bad, and it's don't count on the good lasting either. But if you put your hope in Jesus, you're looking at the end of this thing. That's what we need to really grapple with. We need to, as, as real as it was to Paul, we need to pray to God that our focus is always on heaven. It's always on the end results, the eternal, not the temporary. Um, and it'll help us when we get down and we get disappointed and things aren't perfect or they're wearing out like our bodies or whatever. Um, it's not forever. It is not forever. I remember when I was in officer's training school, I was not well adjusted for the program. I was a rebellious, semi-immature Philadelphia kid. Um, and uh, as those who went through the military, probably the Marine Corps is even worse for crying out loud. Um, you know, it's hard. It's really hard to make that adjustment. But I kept thinking, I got to get through this. I got to finish this. Because once I get through it, the, they're giving me a nice paycheck and I'm going to learn stuff and I'm going to wear a uniform and they're going to salute Captain Mar or it was Lieutenant Marshall at that point. Um, you know, and I'm going to grow and I'm going to have something that is going to be worthwhile. But it was horrible. I was terrible. I, I was I had a, all the demerits and mistakes and I had to learn to carry out orders and get up early and not have enough sleep and, and to run at five o'clock in the morning. At what, I don't know what time you guys got up, but, the, you know, it was rough. But there was a reward at the end that has left, lasted me my whole life. I have learned it changed me, changed my maturity, my discipline, changed my thinking. I learned how to write properly, you know, and effectively. And, um, and to endure suffering and to, do, and to also be thinking about the greater good in the mission. This is kind of what you're going through. Bigger, bigger than you. Bigger rewards than what you can see right now. And it, you're going to have to suffer. There's going to be times of disappointment, times of lack, times of people not loving you or 
treating you improperly or opportunities that seem to be lost. But, but there's the end result that you want to keep. And you know, those who just graduated from college, you went through a hard time, very trying, but there's a maturity that comes from completing that and not giving up. And you may not see the results immediately, but you will. Um, yeah. So what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. This is not life. This is is a temporary place. Life is when we die and when we live with Christ. Life is supposed to be eternal, never ending. This is not life. We will die. We are mortal. And verse 5, He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. That's why I am a pain in the neck at least, or the tongue, on getting people to be baptized in the Holy Spirit so you can see, so that you know that the Holy Spirit is in you, that you've been sealed with this guarantee for eternal life. It also makes me feel more comfortable that the person I'm dealing with has been chosen by Christ. Now, if you don't go to that point, you don't know. You can get baptized in water. That's something that we do, but we don't know for sure what the Spirit has done and what Christ has chosen. You know, people come and go when they get baptized in water. Some people I never see again, and, and they disappear. But, and the ones that have been baptized in the Holy Spirit, I know that even if they go through some trouble, God, Jesus had to do that. He had to bring that about in them. So, And then that is the promise that God's making to you. So don't, don't look at the baptism of the Holy Spirit as something that's not important. It's so important it's so important it it's a guarantee that god chose you and you have a promise of eternal life all right so we are always of good courage no matter what's going on you keep turning that hardship and the disappointments into that promise into the eternal life we know that while we are at home in the body we are away from the lord for we walk by faith, not by sight. That's why your faith is so important. You don't ever want your faith to diminish. So whatever you can do to build your faith up, it is to remember the testimonies. It is to pray trusting God and, and all of these things. And never to give up, that faith is what leads you into the promised land. You walk by faith, not by sight, not by the temporary problems that you have now. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, at home, where is home? He says it right there. Home is not here. That might be why you wake up in the morning and you don't feel right some days. You're a little disappointed. Sometimes you're depressed. God willing, you're not. But if you do get depressed, it's because you're not at home. This is, you shouldn't be too comfortable here. Home is heaven. Home is with Father God. That's home. And you'll know it when you get there. Because all of these problems, all of this stuff you're going through now will disappear. Completely disappear. So you should feel a little bit like this isn't perfect. It's not. And it's not designed to be. And it's a testing of the faith. And whether or not you'll walk by faith and not by sight. And that you have to learn that I would rather be in heaven with God. But that doesn't mean a premature death, okay? You don't, that it'll, might end up somewhere else, right? But it's just knowing that this is going to get better. This is going to get so much better. It's going to be so good, so good. Uh, so whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. Not to please yourself. Not to please the community at large. But to please God. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Part of that process is going to the judgment seat of Christ and being evaluated. For this time, the time here is to prepare for that. And whether you're doing good or evil, he looks at all of it. So what do you want to do when this thing runs out? Do you want to have some good deeds? Or do you want to just have a bunch of evil? Probably not a good idea to do it that way. Um, 
So he's evaluating what you're doing now. That's the importance of this temporary time. It's extremely important. Now, you can be in God's kingdom and not in heaven. So you have Luke 17, 20 to 21. Luke 17, 20 to 21. Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, Jesus, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. So you can be in the kingdom of God now, but not in heaven. The kingdom of God is on earth and heaven at the same time. For those who are born again in Jesus Christ, who have the spirit of God in them. So that's why you can be in the kingdom here. But it's not heaven. Heaven is heaven. It's another place. But his rule and his reign are in both places. Um, and God is everywhere, although his throne is in heaven. So this is a little mind-bending, but that's, that's the way it is. Now, what will heaven be like? I have a whole bunch of things here. Hopefully I can get through them. I have a lot of references, so I'm not going to use them all. You can go back or you can ask me for all of the scripture that I don't share with you today. I'll share some. John 14, 1 to 6. John 14, 1 to 6. Let not your hearts be troubled, Jesus says. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. Well, let me stop at verse 3 there. His Father's house. Jesus' is Father's house house. There are many rooms. These are not just like this hotel vacant waiting for the first guy to show up and pay for the room. The room has your name on it. They're waiting for us to get to our rooms, the Father and the Son. Prepared. Your name is written in heaven. The room's already there, so the expectation is you're going to be there. And Jesus prepared the room for you. He prepared my room for me. Your eternal dwelling. This is not just a house with some dude who owns this place trying to make a profit. It's the father's house. It's, and having a father in the house who loves you and it provides for you is a home. It's not just a place to live like a college dormitory where you just throw your clothes and newspaper on the on the ground all week and the, you know but th this is a, a beautiful place for you Jesus said to him in verse 6 I am the way and the truth and the life no one comes to the father except through me how do I get to the home how do I get to my father it's through Jesus by following Jesus by maintaining my faith in Jesus and having a relationship in Jesus he knows where it is. You don't know how to get there. How do you get to your room in heaven? Do you know the directions? There's one way. You just follow him. He's going to get you there. He prepared it. He's going to deliver you there. Um, here's a number two. We will recline at table. Have leisurely meals in conversation with our brothers and sisters who are also believers, including the famous servants of God in the Bible. Matthew 8, Matthew 8, 11 to 12. Jesus says, I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table. Sobre mesa. But you don't know what that means, so I waste my Spanish on you. <laughs> and, and the Spanish, do you know sobre mesa? You took Spanish, didn't you? Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. it's, it's lingering over the table. We're going to go to Spain in May for our 36th anniversary. So uh, we're going to be sobre mesa. -ing. <laughs> you hang out after you eat. Now they might have an aperitif or a coffee or something. And they ate the meal, but now they linger. They have conversation. They're going to have a little snack. They're going to have a little... Vietnamese do this. They just don't call it that. They, they linger at the table eating little snacks. I think Thai may do the same. Of course, they drink alcohol and stuff, but, but in heaven, there is wine. 
I'm not encouraging anybody to start opening the bottle right now, but <laughs> obviously we're not going to get drunk in heaven and, and, and whatever it is, it's good. But you're going to linger there and you're going to recline, hang out with these people. So Matthew 8, 11, 12, I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. Interesting. The sons of the kingdom will be thrown. That's a scary thought. That's another message, okay? <laughs> that means you could be in the kingdom and still cast out. And th These are probably the, the angels that were cast down and all those who want to follow Satan and not God. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So there are two places, two separate places. Heaven, where you're going to hang out, sobre mesa, you're going to have conversation, love, fellowship. You're going to have an opportunity to meet Abraham. What a cool thing. All those Bible studies. He can correct me, you know, for all those things that I said that weren't right. And, and Paul is going to be there. And they're going to hang out. Can you imagine talking to Paul? I mean, just that you need eternity to pick the dude's brain. So like, what was it like when you were attacked by wild beasts? What was it like when you were naked? I mean, how did you get out of that situation? What were the people's reaction? I mean, uh, what was it like when light came out from, from heaven, you know, and, and shone on around you? Just think. It's just endless discoveries. David, how bad did that feel, man, when you screwed up? Maybe he'll ask you some questions. Well, how did you feel? <laughs> yeah. Um, so fellowship, and then that's what we do afterwards. Remember, I, I mentioned those four pillars that, that caused the early church to grow. The prayer, fellowship, spending meals together. What was the other one? <laughs> study of the word, study of the apostles' word, right? It won't stop. That's what you're going to do in heaven. And worship and sing and praise. But the hanging out part, that, um, when I was in the Air Force, I had 10 minutes to eat when I was in officer's training school. It was the most miserable thing. I got in the habit of just, <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's no pleasure in it, no conversation. I, I shouldn't share this, but Jennifer, have mercy on me. I didn't know you back then, okay. But one day, I had my food, I sat down, and there was this one very, very pretty girl from Alabama that was who decided to sit with me that day. So good that this didn't last, Jennifer, no problem, okay. <laughs> and while we're doing, and, and I'm talking to her, and she, she's from some little town in Alabama, and I said I'm from Philadelphia, and she goes, oh, really? What's that like? Like she was actually interested because she had never been to a big city before. And I thought, oh my gosh, and now I gotta go, you know. <laughs> Ten minutes, that's all I got to do. So anyway, Jen, it all worked out for the best. This is much better, much better. Uh, anyway, so it's not like that where you just have to eat and run, but you can actually make a connection with people, have a relationship with people, like Jennifer and I do now all the time. Like we had last night, a nice dinner where we could talk and eat. Anyway. I don't want to overdo that and get myself into any more trouble. <laughs> All right, number three, there will be different levels of reward. Some will be rewarded more than others. Uh, and the quality of your works will be used to determine that. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 to 10. So it's not everybody, it's not uh, communism. Everybody doesn't show up and get issued the same clothes and the same bowl and get the same food. and the same. You have different levels of reward in heaven based on what you did here. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 to 10. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Matthew eleven eleven. Truly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. There's, a, there's an order. He who humbles himself, this is Matthew 18, 4. He who humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Your humility will determine your position in heaven. Your good deeds. This is all part of that judgment. So what you do now matters forever. And God will reward those who are doing the good deeds with the right heart 
and those who are humble. If you're proud and arrogant, you're always competing with other people, especially other Christians, to show you're better. I think Facebook is a, is a terrible, terrible thing for Christians, even though I use it to publish. This. But it, it creates this, this envy with one another. You know, and I have to show that I'm doing and it even causes people, I think, to lie, you know, to make it look better than what they are and, and to, to claim things that they, you know, and to make their family look better and their church look better. Everything's really smooth there, you know. That's why we don't publish pictures here. <laughs> but that, everything's to try to make it look falsely better. And then if you do that, you get no reward because he also says um, if you pray to uh, show off, well, if you... If you pray in your prayer closet, God recognizes you. But for those that are, are you know, they, you don't know what your right hand is doing, left hand. But for those that do it as a spectacle in front of people, you, it says you receive no reward in heaven. You will receive no reward for that. So we have a twisted view of things. We think that we can fool him. You can fool people sometimes, but you're not going to fool God. And your rewards are in this humility and the things that you do in private and not showing off and not trying to get credit for yourself. And every time you do the opposite, you get no reward. You're wasting your time. And if you're not humble, if you're proud, always trying to boast, and I know this and I did that and look at me, you know, look at me. Zero. That's the way he thinks. That's the way heaven works. Do you want to go to heaven and have a bunch of proud, arrogant show-offs? He doesn't, obviously. If you are, and you make it to heaven, you're down here. And everybody will know. There's nothing's hidden. Nothing's hidden. Everything that is done in the dark will be exposed in the light. That's what he says. Whatever you whisper in the darkness or in the private, it will be shouted from the rooftop. So every time you... Talk bad about your pastor in private, uh, or, or somebody. Sorry, I didn't mean to say that. Uh, but but if you criticize and you gossip about other people, just shout it out, baby. You know, didn't say anything that he didn't hear. And your thoughts are even exposed, right? So different levels of reward. Oh, here's another. Luke 6, 22. Blessed are you when people hate you. And when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Every time that you were godly, every time that you shared the word of God and people attacked you or made fun of you. You talk about doing deliverance. You talk about healing. You talk about the gospel. And you get attacked for that. Blessed are you, for you'll be rewarded. But the ones who cave in and compromise to society and to their friends and family, you lose your reward. It has to be for Jesus. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. And then here's a warning about rich people. Luke 6, 24. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. Don't try to please people, especially pastors or ministers. Don't make people happy. It's better that they curse you than to give up on the truth of the gospel. It's better to have a small church now than to be, and to be rewarded in heaven than to please every person. I was talking to my friend at work. I said, you know, everybody, if, if, I let every, if I looked at everybody's desires, even in our little church, you might all have a different Bible version. You might all have a different perspective on the communion and our prayer and all of this. And if I ran around trying to please each person, I'd be exhausted, and then everybody else would hate me. I said, I have to look at the scripture, and I have to preach what I see there. I can't compromise. I can't say, well, this is going to offend so-and-so or this is, I can't do that. I can't say, well, people aren't going to like uh, preaching against, you know, homosexuality or abortion or things like this. They're, they're going to, you know, just to keep people coming. I can't do that. Everybody's going to have a different political view. I can't worry about that. I've got to look at the scripture and, 
ask the Holy Spirit to help me and preach that. Because I get rewarded for that. I don't get rewarded when I compromise everybody's opinion. I'd rather do that. I'm 61 this month. How many more days do I have? I don't know. Do I have one? <laughs> do I have 35 or 40? I don't know. I mean, years. <laughs> um, I don't know. But I, I know it's going to end. Um, yeah. Oh, here it is. Matthew 6, 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. None. You get nothing. It's all fake. You go home and you, you treat each other poorly, and then you come to church and you look nice and everything. Nothing. Matthew 5, maybe I will give you all the verses, 5 and 19. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. This is what I'm talking about. I cannot compromise on the word of God because you don't like it or someone else doesn't like it. I will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. What I'm doing is building up my reward in heaven. When I call out the pagan... Aspects of Christmas and Easter? I'm not doing it to please you. I'm doing it because I can see in the Word that this is idolatry. This is wrong. My reward isn't from you guys. It's from Him. And you have to live the same way. Pull out the fake. Expose the fake. All right. Here's the number four. I got better get moving. I just saw the time. There. There's a separation between heaven above and hell below. So Luke 16, you've got Lazarus, the poor guy, and then you got the rich guy, and the rich guy's in Hades. He's suffering in fire and torment and no water and thirst. And he looks up, and he can see Abraham and Lazarus up in the, in the, in the good place where God is, um, which would be a temporary heaven or the, whatever heaven is like right now. And uh, he says, hey, Father Abraham, would you please send Lazarus down to just give me some water on the tip of my tongue? And he says, sorry, man, you know, you had your chance. You lived really well and Lazarus was poor and, and you ignored him. You didn't care for his needs. And now you're in torment and he's being comforted in the presence of God. And there's a barrier that no one from heaven can come down to you and you cannot come up to us. So once you're dead and you're assigned your place in heaven or hell, there is no purgatory like the Catholics teach. It's one or the other. And there is no way to go between the two. It's done. But those in hell can see heaven. They can see all the good things that are going on and the beauty and the pleasure that those people have. But the people in heaven, I don't think Lazarus can see. Because he, he doesn't talk to the rich man. It's Abraham. Abraham must have been gifted to, to have this conversation. But for us, we're not going to be aware of hell. We're not going to be aware of those who are in hell. They're there. You're just not going to, because there is no suffering, no mourning, no grief in heaven. So you can't possibly be aware of your relatives and friends who didn't make it. Otherwise, you'd be grieving. So that has to be blocked out. It's completely separate. So right now is the time to, to witness Share the gospel. Because once it's over, it's over. No purgatory. No indulgences. Um, number five, there will be few people who are rich on earth that make it to heaven. Matthew 19, 23. And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. So those who are desiring to be rich right now, you're deceiving yourself. You're actually making it harder for yourself to get into heaven. I'm not saying you should be poor, and I'm not saying you shouldn't work hard and save and do those smart things. But if you're greedy and you're just aspiring constantly to be rich, the odds are lower for you to actually make it to heaven. Doesn't mean you won't make it, just harder, because you're so absorbed by the things of the world. And if Lazarus had been attended to by this rich guy, if he had given him some love and shared his wealth with the poor, uh, it is possible... Maybe he would have made it. I don't know. But don't expect in heaven to see a lot of Bill Gateses or Warren Buffetts. They just won't be there. Um, but you could be rich in heaven, but it's not based on your wealth on earth. Matthew 6, 19, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth 
where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Do the good deeds. Do, do it out of humility. Love your wife. Love your husband. Love your children. Respect your parents. Honor your parents. Love your brothers and sisters in Christ. Be generous. Share the gospel. Pray for the sick. Pray for one another. Uh, build up treasure in heaven. For those that decide to go to work when they could be pursuing God. I mean, we all have to work. But if you have a choice and you decide, I'm going to make an extra $10 an hour here, um, and it really wasn't that important, but you wanted to build up a little 50 bucks so you could get you know, a new pair of tennis shoes, or maybe it's $100 now. Um, just think about it. Doesn't mean you shouldn't work when, but but what are you really? What's really in your heart? Number six, you will not be married in heaven. There will be no sex in heaven. Sorry to disappoint some of you. No babies will be born. Okay, uh, you will not be bound there by blood relatives. Why do I say that? Mark twelve twenty four. Jesus said to them, "This is not the reason you are wrong, because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry." nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses in the past? Okay, this is about God, verse 27. He is not God of the dead, but God of the living. So um, you're not going to be married. And if you're not married in God's kingdom, you can't have sex. So there's no sex in heaven. What are you going to do? What about you? <laughs> have to take up ice cream eating. I don't know. Making ice cream. <laughs> All right, so no babies. And your family, your relatives are those that do God's will. There's nobody else there. So your, your blood relatives on earth, they may not be there. Invest in those who will be your long-term relatives. Who is my mother? Jesus said, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. See, that's how we establish relationships. Number seven, all nations will be there. Revelation 5, 9. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language, and people, and nation. Everybody. We're not just talking about white Christian nationalists in Alabama, okay? We got everybody's there. Every color, every language. Thank God. I would get so bored. That's why I live in Chantilly, so I can eat every kind of food. <laughs> in heaven, I can have every kind of food. Number eight, we will have new heavenly bodies. So Paul says in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 44, it is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So you, like Jesus had a change when he died, was resurrected. You know, he was able to just kind of appear wherever he wanted to. And, um, but before he had died and was resurrected, he was limited like you and me. So there's a change in our body. Uh, also interesting in verse 50, uh, verse 50, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. So Jesus has no blood in him now. It was bled out. And he does not have our flesh, but he has a heavenly body. So when we get there, no flesh and blood. You will not cut yourself and bleed. Ah, but we shall all be changed. Bodies will not wear out. They will be heavenly. There is rule and authority coming from heaven. Uh, 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 Ephesians 3.14. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Um, so he, the Father is in heaven. He's in charge. It's not a... It's not a, a government without love or without fatherhood. Um, I have a lot more, but it is 45 minutes, so it's time to wrap this up. Uh, quickly, though, there is no Satan. Satan was kicked out of heaven. I saw fate, Satan fall like lightning from heaven, Jesus said. Um, 
and there are thousands and thousands of angels, I would say millions based on the description. Um, and they are all with people who have had uh, belief in the Lord. They are worshiping God. There is a throne in heaven. There's lightning and thunder coming from it. There's an emerald, like a green um, rainbow over that throne. It appears that there's a, a, a sea of crystal. If you think about, we talked about the, um, the tabernacle. So there's, it's the same thing. There's an altar. There are seven angels, seven spirits of God, rather, in front of that. There's the, the holy sea, the, the, um, uh, the altar of incense. So all of that is, rep but it's on a grand scale. And Jesus, the high priest, is there. And he's serving before God at the right hand of the Father. The throne is a brownish color. Um, it is called jasper, but it's also crystal. I don't know what that means. We're going to have a new holy city, okay, that comes from heaven. And it is a square cube larger, about 300 miles larger than the moon. It's a cube. So if you think of the moon, just add 300 miles to the diameter of that. And that'll be the new Jerusalem, new holy city that'll come down. There will be no sun or moon. The light will come from the Father and the Son, as you can tell, I'm running out of time. And uh, But you will have direct access to him. And from the throne of God will come a river that's flowing of life. And on each side of the river are trees that bear fruit every month. And there's healing in the leaves of the tree of life that is also there, which you will have access to if you are if you have overcome and been with the Lord. Um, there is no evil. There is no sexual morality. There is no idolatry there. There's no greed. There's no lying. And um, there, there is also the Ark of the Covenant there. Um, and there is no war. And let me just leave you with this. Um, leave you with this or this. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and then there are four living creatures around them covered by eyes. One has the face of a lion, one of an ox, one of a man, one of an eagle in flight. And then there are 24 elders clothed in white linen with gold, gold crowns on. And every time that they worship God, they, pull down, they fall down on the ground. They put their crown down. They also have instruments, harps, and they sing. There's a lot of singing and worshiping of God there. And the streets are gold, but it's a transparent gold. The whole city radiates the glory of God, and there are four gates, each a whole pearl, and there's an angel each next to each gate. And it's the, the, the walls of the city are 216 feet high, and they're beautiful, decorated with all kinds of gold, uh, all kinds of jewels. And uh, the foundation, the base of this city is the 12, with the names of the 12 apostles. So that would be, I guess, Matthias instead of, instead of Judas. And, um, but the, the gold there is transparent, so you can kind of see through it. Um, all right. But remember, that's coming out of heaven, that cube. That's where you're going to live. And God will be with us, and he'll walk among us. So there you go. Let's see. And now I will end it with a reminder of the Lord's Prayer, because... He says, Matthew 6, 9 to 13, pray then like this. This is 6, 10, our father, 9, excuse me, and 10. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There we go. So all of that is up there. All of that is waiting for you, but you must overcome. You must conquer because it says, he who conquers will be able to eat of the tree of life. So while you're on this short journey, you don't give up. You keep your faith. Remember that there's accountability. And even if you do make it to heaven, there are different levels of rewards. So make the most of your time now. Think, what does God mean by treasure in heaven? What am I building up? And also remember that there will be few rich people and no greedy, no liars, no sexual immoral people. Now we, we've got the healing blood of Christ to help us with all of those sins, but we need to press forward and remember what's ahead of us. Lord God, we thank you, Lord, for that resurrection power that gives us eternal life. We thank you for the living hope in you, Jesus, and that we have an eternal heaven in store for us, and that we don't focus on the temporary struggles too much here, but that we remember there's a great blessing that's coming for all of us in heaven. 
we thank you, God. And that's the meaning of the resurrection, that there is another life, that there is a permanent place, a home with our Father. And we're most grateful. We pray for each person to be strengthened on this temporary journey and to be reminded every day of what's coming and the blessings that come with it. In Jesus' name, we pray.